Hello, friends of Byzantium. Welcome back to the podcast, The Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I'm back from a necessary two-month break at the end of the summer and early fall, and I'm ready to bring you some of the more fascinating things that are going on in the area of Byzantine studies. I've got some great episodes lined up for you. I hope you find them as uh, interesting as I do. So let's get right to it. And today we'll be talking about one of the fundamental problems that affects art history in particular, but also, I think, uh, the study of literature as well in pre-modern societies. And I want to introduce this problem by postulating a distinction that I'm taking from the historian uh, Pocock. Distinction between viewing the past as a series of moments of creation on the one hand, or as a more linear and continual process of transmission on the other hand. So what did he mean by that? Or how does it relate to the problem that we'll be talking about today? So there's one model that tends to view cultures as relatively coherent, discrete, um, and distinctive, you know, units, uh, you know, of either of time or, you know, the lived experience of a group of people in a particular place at a particular time. And the essence of their culture is defined primarily in terms of the things that they produce, new stuff, you know, moments of creation. They, it might be introduced by some kind of cultural Big Bang, uh, or it might evolve over a period of, I don't know, a century or something, but it results in a new distinctive visual style or what have you that is distinct from what had gone before. Even if all of the stuff that had gone before still existed at that time and, and carried on, soldiered on, you know, and continued to be present in the visual landscape. So, for example, Byzantine artistic culture defined by icons and, you know, later mosaics, not by all of the accumulated art of antiquity that continued to survive and was very visible. The same thing happens in literature. So, for example, Byzantine literature defined as the original creations, um, you know, literary compositions of authors in real time, and not necessarily by all the vast accumulated body of texts that continue to be survive, that survive and are copied and are read, and that you know influence their thinking as much as anything that they're writing. So the stuff that is created in real time counts as distinctively Byzantine. That's what you're going to find in a Byzantine art history book or in a Byzantine literature book. Not all of the stuff that they are nevertheless actually seeing and interacting with, but that was created in a previous moment. So all the other stuff fall under the category of transmission. Right? So then it's up to you to have a model to decide what the value of that transmission is, what its cultural valence is. It's stuff made by other people that's just kind of still knocking around. What's it doing? By way of contrast, I'd like to note that this is much less of a problem in, say, institutional history or political history or economic history. You know, if a state is using a particular administrative apparatus in the 10th or the 12th century that was created a thousand years earlier, no historian is going to say, eh, but we're not going to talk about that because it's not an original creation of the culture that we're studying, you know, a thousand years later. No, it's very much part of the lived reality. So this distinction becomes very acute and very interesting when it comes to, say, ancient statues and temples, especially ancient statues in Constantinople, of which we know there were hundreds and the people who lived in Constantinople engage with them on many, many levels. They're not considered Byzantine art. Because of the way art history is periodized, they're considered ancient art and fall under the province of ancient art historians. When ancient art historians talk about their material, quote, their material uh, in Constantinople, they will often say very strange things. One of the strangest that I've come across is that all of those statues had no meaning whatsoever. They were just meaningless, accumulated debris of antiquity that was in Constantinople for some reason. Right, so this is an extreme example of what happens when periodization is applied this way 
that it cuts between the parallel levels of transmission that are going on in real time. But what happens if we take all layers of the transmission, you know, what's going on simultaneously, regardless of the period of creation, seriously? So this is exactly what my guest today set out to do. Uh, this is Paroma Chatterjee, a professor at the University of Michigan, uh, whom you might recall from an earlier episode of this, namely number nine. I urge you to go check it out. So she's trying to do justice to the pagan statues that were all over the place in Constantinople uh, in a recent book called Between the Pagan Past and Christian Present in Byzantine Visual Culture, Statues in Constantinople, 4th to 13th Centuries CE. As it turns out, ancient statues in many domains of the political imagination, of artistic imagination, of even everyday fears and hopes and anxieties, gave icons a run for their money. So these statues were very much present uh, in every sense of the word, like existentially present. And they need to be fit into the picture. They need to claim a bigger piece of the pie in a way. Um, and so we need new models and concepts in order to do that um, fully and, and do them justice, right? So beyond the trope that these Orthodox Byzantines were afraid of statues because of demons and so forth. So got to get past that. Anyway, we also had a very fun discussion, so I hope you enjoy it too. Before we get to it, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Uh, without any further delay, here's my conversation with Paroma Chatterjee. Hello, Paroma. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Anthony. It's uh, such a pleasure always to talk to you. <laughs> So you're in Dumbarton Oaks now, right? In Washington? Yes, I am. I had spent a, a week there before the <laughs> lockdowns began. And, but I did manage to record some conversations there that, that became you know, later podcast episodes. So uh, it's too bad I can't be there. Uh, but yeah. you know, we'll do it remotely. That's fine. So statues. Statues in the round, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not what most people will think of when you say Byzantine art. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> right. Um, and so you wrote a book on statues, statues in Constantinople in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into the claims that you make in the book. Uh, I, I think they're pretty important arguments. Uh, mm -hmm. But why don't you start off by telling us how did all of these statues get to Constantinople? How is it that it had all these hundreds of statues? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the point of endowing the city with them? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you for the questions. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I mean, first of all, all those statues came from other parts of the empire. And we have, in fact, this whole litany of names uh, in the in the Patria, the 10th century text. So just to rattle off a few of them, you know, they came from Athens, Rome, Nicomedia, Caesarea, um, I mean, um, Antioch, Sicily, Crete, Rhodes. I mean, you, you just name it. They just brought statues uh, from the FBR to believe the Patria, which I, I suppose a lot of people don't. But um, I think that gives us a nice glimpse into the just the geographical range from mm. where statues must have come. And um, they were brought, I think, mainly for the reason, you know, uh, to deck out the new capital of the empire, but also for various other reasons. I think, I mean, statues were such a significant part of the visual culture, the ritual culture um, of, um, of antiquity. And I don't think they just dropped out. Uh, they didn't drop out clearly. They, they were brought mm -hmm. uh, across miles, you know, to adorn Constantinople. And I don't think their powers just dropped out all of a sudden uh, after the fourth century. So, yeah. Yeah, so what was the point of, of bringing them all? Why did the emperors want to endow Constantinople with this uh, uh, statuesque armature? Um, well, I mean, uh, one um, very strong uh, foundational strand of scholarship, uh, uh, you know, from Sarah Bassett uh, onward has argued that it is because this is the civic decor of any antique uh, city mm -hmm. and that's what they were following. And that absolutely makes sense. I mean, that is what you would see in cities. But um, I think this could be extended to think about how uh, I mean, this was appropriating, of course, what was already their own. I mean, this is, these are uh, parts of their own empire. It's like moving around things in your own house from the drawing room to the, you know, yeah, some yeah. other 
Uh, but it's also just about using their resident powers. It's, I, I don't think it was just about form. That has been the main focus of our mm -hmm. study. Though they, they love these, you know, because they looked nice, but mm -hmm. they didn't really use them. But, you know, they were used, I mean, definitely to prophecy things. They were used um, uh, to uh, have certain kinds of processions around with, as we find in the early centuries. They were used to think about beauty. Uh, they were, you know, uh, yeah. I think it was, poss I mean, I would go so far as to say it must have been unimaginable to the Romans to think of their surroundings without statues. That's the impression yeah. I get. Um, yeah, especially if you're building a city that's supposed to evoke Rome in some ways, because Rome itself was full of these. Yeah. Um, but as you were speaking, I just thought of an extreme example of how the statues are um, sort of culturally productive without even necessarily being seen. And this was the, the Palladium, uh, the, the just a little statue of Athena that supposedly protects a city from being conquered that allegedly, we have no idea whether this is true, but they believed it, that allegedly Constantine buried underneath his column in the forum. So nobody actually saw this. It wasn't like, a, like yeah. an art historical moment. It was clearly a sort of magical talismanic moment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, your own work on the forum, uh, which I've gone to repeatedly, actually, to look at uh, on the forum of Constantine and, and the kind yeah, of yeah. statues that uh, that were there. I mean, that uh, that too, just the fact that you would have these. Yes. In the space. Yeah. And I was I always struck by like letters from the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries where they're saying someone's beauty is comparable to the statue of so and so. And you know, it took me a while actually to figure out, oh, wait, no, that statue might have actually been <laughs> around the corner. And like they, they know what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So what happened to all these statues? Why can't we see them today? Well, uh, I mean, I guess the uh, in the narrative, it is that the, the Fourth Crusade happened in 1204 and that a number of these were just uh, smashed, you know, melted down to make coins, currency, but also a number of them were just carted away. And I think it's this hold of, uh, the, of, of the ancient city, which was expressed and extended in Constantinople that we see replicated in Venice mm. um, in its main piazza. What really struck me as I was writing the book, and I think I mentioned it, uh, this too, they really, displayed the statuary, the columns and statues in their public places. And I think that also stands for something that even in the 13th century, which we think of as being medieval in quotes, right? Uh, this is when uh, there's no paganism, that this is, a, you know, uh, everything is a bastion of Christianity in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's clearly, I mean, that's not what they're doing in their uh, public spaces in certain parts of Europe. That's yes. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how we define mm -hmm. religion to include, yeah. like, you know, certain kinds of yeah. artifacts and objects like icons and to exclude things that are clearly doing religious work, though. Um, so yeah. Yeah. we'll get into that. Um, I recall um, Jas Elsner, so he and I had done a, a joint presentation on the survival of classical culture, mm -hmm. and I was doing the sort of more text part and he was doing the uh, sort of statues and art part. Yeah. And we alternated. This was um, at the Getty in California some years ago. And just mm -hmm. putting our materials together, he made the following observation, which I thought was really great. Mm -hmm. That in terms of the classical Greek texts that we have today, we mm -hmm. have the ones that Byzantines chose to preserve. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the classical statuary, we have all the second rate stuff that they left behind. <laughs> Because all they took all the good stuff too to Constantinople and it just got destroyed by fires, by the Fourth yeah. Crusade, by whatever. Yeah. And yeah, and so there's and so he pointed out this asymmetry in the materials that like yeah. classicists and ancient art historians. I, it was great. I loved it. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great observation. That is. I mean. um, it's very much like him, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so one of the tensions in your book, and, and you keep coming back to it in the different chapters in different ways, is sort of contrasting the public visibility and sort of imaginative functions of statues compared to those of icons. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I'll explain this a little bit in the introduction too, but that sort of icons are the, I don't want to use the word iconic, but archetypal, 
sort of what, whatever we, what we think of when we think of Byzantine art. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this has been reinforced by uh, the, you know, a century or more of scholarship. Mm -hmm. But you make the point that icons would not have been very visible in public spaces. There were very, very few. Yeah. Um, and that those public spaces were con conversely dominated by statuary. Um, and so could you tell us a little bit about what kinds of spaces one mm -hmm. could see ancient statues in? Um, because you make this point that there are a lot of people who would have been far more like visually aware of statues yeah. than of the icons that we study, which were often like in some pretty obscure places or like the famous Sinai icon. I have a replica of, of this above my mm -hmm. desk. Yeah. And I just think of it as like, you know, image of Christ that no one ever saw really. <laughs> like you had to <laughs> yeah. go to Sinai and it's not easy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So what kind of places were statues in? Um, well, they were outside. I think that's that's my first thing. They were also inside. Again, if we are to believe some of those <laughs> texts yeah. like Parastasis, you know, that, that apparently Hagia Sophia was filled with statues, which itself is, is just such an interesting concept to think about, be it true or false. But uh, they were definitely outside. So uh, as you, you, you know, as you've pointed out, it, it, it pointed out in your work on the Forum, the Forum of Constantine, the Hippodrome, which I think was one of the most important spaces. It's a space where people came, tourists, citizens, ambassadors, diplomats, you know, the, the guy who tried to fly in the air and fell flat on his face, right. um, emperors. I mean, um, that was studded with statues, not a single, you know, Christian figure there uh, right. or, or an image. Um, the Augusteon, uh, along the Mese, I believe there were uh, yeah. statues, but also not just spaces within the city, but uh, I've been looking, re-looking at some of the literature on the, the Golden Gate. Uh, right, right. Statues. And I believe uh, I uh, bumped into Anne-Marie Walkar, uh, wonderfully, and Nancy Shevchenko, while, I, while I've been here in Dumbarton Oaks, and they pointed out, Anne-Marie pointed out to me that there was she could recall just one uh, mention of an icon mentioned by Anthony Cutler, actually, and this was attested to by a Russian pilgrim, but it was an icon that is on the outside of the Golden Gate mm -hmm. and which apparently had, uh, you know, it, it had relic-like qualities. So it's very striking to me that you don't find images, icons, you know, the way we imagine them to be in, in the city. I mean, where are they? I can't find any text that talks about them. Now, it could be that perhaps they were ubiquitous and nobody cared to just write about them mm. but it still seems to me that it, I mean one factor is just sheer size I think these statues would have been more visible just because they were so damn big mm -hmm. <laughs> and they must have been the Romans loved making big statues they carted they wouldn't have carted tiny ones although they possibly they did yeah. and um even if we even if we are extremely skeptical of Coniatis and so on and so forth. I, I don't think those statues were tiny at all. So I think- Oh, no, no, some were quite huge. No, they were huge. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. if you read Coniatis, you know, about how um, Heracles's thumb had to be encircled with a, you know, with a girdle of a, for a man's belt because it was so huge. Yeah. It is plausible. It is absolutely plausible. And if we look at what little remains, like the obelisks, you know, uh, the serpent column, I think these, these would have dominated in a yeah. way that just panel paintings or mosaics and things just would not have. Yeah, and I should add, uh, for the benefit of the audience, that when when we mention statues, we're also including like carved reliefs that were brought also from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, like I, I know a series on the feats of Hercules that was put up. So these are like panels that were put on walls yes. um, or the doors of the Senate House, um, yeah. which had a depiction of the Gigantomachy, the, the battles between the gods and the, the giants. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those kinds of mythological motifs, whether in relief or in the round. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so when I think about it, probably the most famous public image of Christ is the one on the Halki gate, the entrance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we keep debating about whether it existed until it was, you know, the ninth yeah. century when yeah. maybe it was put. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But there are all these traditions that, you know, kept being put up and taken down by the iconoclast, but it turns out it's probably just put up at the end. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was one, you know, I can't really think of many others. 
Um, I mean, apparently ch a church council under... F in the million. Because in the million, so again, yeah. on the gates. But how yeah. visible would these have been? They might, I mean, I'm perfectly willing to believe that there might have been uh, images of saints put up uh, on shop fronts and things like that. But my point is, how visible were they in relation to statues? And sure, I think, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 I think that's what fascinates me. And when we think, if we even care to concede that, yes, perhaps statues were dominant, how might that just change? the way we think about sacred images. Exactly. And this is the point of your book. And so this is what I want to focus on here, because um, there is a tradition in scholarship of kind of dismissing the statues as being merely ornamental. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have literally, literally, I have found um, scholars of ancient art who say they didn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Which is striking. Uh, like on the face of it, that's not the first place you would go to, right? to interpret them. Um, and your whole, your book is about what they actually meant and that they actually did perform quite a bit of interpretive labor, yeah. um, even in a sacred context. And yeah. so you treat them as sacred objects and not just as like ornamental secular ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about one of the categories that you highlight, which is prophecy. Yeah. So statues were very closely linked to so prophetic traditions yeah. and anxieties and so forth. So tell us a little bit about this and, and how they imbued statuary with a kind of sacred aura. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say that I think statues retained part of their sacred aura, I think, uh, it, it, I mean, what I mean is in the, in the sense that one doesn't have to be uh, pagan necessarily, or I mean, it doesn't matter what religion one personally professes right, right. in order to, uh, to yes, yes. accept Ex that something exactly has right. another sacred. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, I mean, just, just to give a contemporary example, which I think is very relevant. So in my home city of Calcutta, you know, we worship the mother goddesses. Uh, those are huge, Kali and Durga. But right now, our biggest festival is taking place for the mother goddess Durga, uh, with the ten-armed goddess. And one of the biggest shrines, they make these temporary shrines over this thing. One of the biggest ones is the Vatican. They've placed our mother goddess in this constructed artificial uh, St. Peter's Vatican. And huh. everybody, we know this is a church. This is, you know, everybody yeah. knows it. It doesn't detract from the fact that we are goddess worshipping Hindu, Bengalis, yeah. Brahmins, or whatever we are. And that, you know, we also recognize that this is the, you know, the... the the home church of, uh, you know, this is the seat of Catholicism. One day I want them to make Hagia Sophia and put our goddess and I'm going to suggest to some of those committees because these are actually very important. They take months to prepare these and they are really detailed. Wait, and so what, what does the Vatican uh, sort of replica image add to the image of the goddess? That's a great thing. That's a great point. It, it, in some ways, it's it works both ways because it very much recognizes that the Vatican is this really important thing, but it equally recognizes that our mother goddess is powerful and important enough to have a seat in it. <laughs> you know, okay. this completely, completely not Christian, you know, yeah. uh, thing. So it's so it's that it's that kind of mentality that really fascinates me. And I feel we see that here. Um, and as for, uh, you know, to come to the point about the, their prophetic powers, I mean, this I feel is fascinating because other than maybe two instances, and those are so faint in the sources, two instances, one of the empress, you know, Zoe with her antiphonitis icon, mm -hmm. and the other of an image of the Theotokos, which refused to enter the church in Thessaloniki before an invasion. Other than those, I don't see I, uh, sacred images in Byzantium being invested with the power of prophecy. It's just not there. You know, they may lament, they may cry, they may, you know, do things. They may lament after the fact, um, but they don't really, uh, they do not foretell events in the future, but statues do. And it seems this is, uh, I won't say absolutely continuous, but it's, it's very much there in the tradition, in the textual tradition. Uh, over a long period, and this this idea that the images carved on statues or just a statue itself, if interpreted properly, can just tell us what will happen. Um, 
I mean, there's some literature that has rightly pointed out that, I mean, this, this was a prophetic trajectory that the statues actually, and this, this is the power that they had. And it's fascinating to me that somehow images of Christ, the Theotokos, the saints just were not seen as doing that. They did mm. some other things, but they didn't do this. Um, right. And I should reinforce the point that this isn't about the, the ancient religions associated with those statues. It's not because one is, yeah. it's not Apollo, right, who is acting behind all of this. That's not how it works. The, yeah. And the statues that are conduits for this kind of prophetic power and anxiety are not even necessarily statues of gods. They, 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 they yes. can be anything, right? Exactly. It, yeah, it's, it's all in like how you interpret them and they become conduits and you can see them functioning as such if you're like a skilled interpreter or something like that, right? Yes, um, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it's almost as if this is a kind of power that, a kind of residual cultural power that icons and Christian figures didn't or couldn't pick up and that they were kind of outsourced to you know it's like we're, <laughs> we're going to use the the ancient stuff to channel these kinds of yes. uh, fears and hopes and so forth yeah that's a great way of putting it actually the outsourcing I really like that I really like that idea but it, it I think it makes us think also about how uh, they were thinking about what could different media do what could different categories of images do and what could they not do Right. Why they couldn't, yeah. Yeah, there's so many stories of emperors being afraid uh, of something that a statue <laughs> did or implied, yeah. right? And Exactly. Yeah, I, I still don't understand exactly why statues in particular, but they definitely became a focus point of a lot of this anxiety. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I um, so, yeah. it might have to do with, uh, with their longevity, just the fact that they'd just been around um uh, mm. you know, christian figures i mean christianity came late <laughs> into the game that's i mean that's mm. that's i think that's i feel that that's a perpetual anxiety in a lot of cases i mean some of john chrysostom's you know uh sermons and things that i've read it's like yeah yeah we we, we came a bit late but but we were kind of there before it's it's constantly yeah. trying to say we were kind of always there yeah <laughs> It's over defensiveness. Uh, at least that's how I read it. But you know, I'm a pagan, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. I mean, Constantinople, you would find a lot of pagans. I think, even if they didn't yes, admit it. Yes, I agree. Um, so, what what are some other things that statues could do that icons generally don't? Uh, like, not just things they could do, but also yeah. like things they were good for thinking with, to oh. use a, a a modern expression. Yes, um, and that uh, brings me to an expression that you used a little earlier, which I really like, the, the imaginative sort of uh, uh, landscape also that, that statues wrought in a way that uh, sacred images could not. So one of them was, I, I think it's ways to think about longevity and endurance. I mean, the history of sacred imagery is very truncated. And iconoclasm is that one big rupture, you know, and I think mm. that that is that is definitely seen as a rupture. It's something that just breaks apart any, you know, attempt, even even, even artificial attempts at saying that, oh, sacred images have always been there. There's continuity. It's just not. I mean, this iconoclasm is an event that they commemorate the end of. So yeah. it's very much there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the statues, in contrast, um, just have endured longevity which is what they were obsessed with you know we want to we want to endure you know the last you know who will be the last emperor who will come back the second coming so that is one thing then as you pointed out beauty that you see in letters and so on uh, right here i was reading an essay by karalambos bakirzis which talks about a late 15th century uh, sort of poem an epitaph i think in which this woman is lamenting and, she, and again she, she says you know you you were like a statue you have the beauty of a statue and so on mm -hmm. it's, it's just there, this idea of, of beauty and statues. Um, and uh, even just, just the idea of imitation, which of course is a very, it, it's an ancient right. concept, yes. long tradition. And again, we, I don't find that so much in the discourse in sacred images, the way I find it with statues. Yeah. But they were clearly doing all this work. 
Um, but I think even just having that, looking at them the way they occupied space would have been so different from the way sacred images did. So yes. Mm -hmm. So now that I heard you saying that, I was reminded of. Um, so trying to understand what it was about statues that elicited this kind of um, attention, veneration in quotation marks, but also anxiety. And you're right to insist on imitation, like the way in which a statue imitates life or a, a real yeah. person must have seemed very uncanny. Yes. Right, to a culture that didn't have lots of, you know, craftsmen around who could do that on a moment's notice. Yes, right. Yes. So it was this skill from the past to imitate life often in ways that so the Byzantines tell us that they seem to think that this was very uncanny, how close this is to, to reality, yeah. but yet not real. Did you know the um, the expression uncanny valley, which is um, it's you know, it's so it's a term that's used in connection with CGI. Oh, I see. Yeah. So oh. there are cases where like, I don't know. Did, um, like where they use CGI to bring back an actor from like decades ago oh, and make them look yeah, young yeah. again. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, right, yes. right, right. Or to fully animate someone's face and the right. face is one of the most difficult things to, to animate correctly. Right. It's always a little bit off, mm -hmm. right? And so it's this experience of, like if you're watching a cartoon, you don't get this uneasy experience because you know that you know what you're watching is not meant yes. to be like fully realistic. But when you're okay. seeing CGI that is trying to tell you, look, no, this is 100% like, like watching a human being, yeah. but you can tell that it's not. There's all these yes. microscopic things that are off. Yes, yes. And it's this uncanny feeling and it, it, it's, it makes us all feel yes. weird. I yes. sometimes wonder if they had that kind of experience around these statues. Um, I'm sure they did. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, when, when, you know, those people went and, for instance, had sexual intercourse with statues, I wonder if the next day they... they right. Or if there was... <laughs> yes, so I many stories that... about that. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from, a, you know, many, for a long, long time, I believe that one of the functions of classical culture in Byzantium is to supplement what's missing from <laughs> Christian culture, right? Right. And, and the statues almost hit that so well, like ideas of physical beauty, yeah. of, you know, martial, you know, qualities of, yes. you know, the, the, the statesmen of the democracy speaking before the assembly, like those kinds of images were things that, you know, the New Testament doesn't, doesn't talk about those things, right? but that right. are always important. Right. And that in this sense, all these, exactly as you said, all these protestations that, you know, oh, our culture is self-sufficient for us. We don't need all this ancient stuff is belied by the fact that they kept returning to this ancient stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and the statues seem to be such a perfect, you know, they're paragons of these things. Um, so another theme that you raise is like, even within Christian material culture, it's not the icons that are doing a lot of the, even the religious work. And so you talk about um, it, like, for example, especially in public, in processions, mm -hmm. um, and even in like miraculous powers yeah, and yeah. things like that, it's relics, right, yeah. that are far more powerful. Yes. Um, and yeah, and yeah. often the emphasis on like, yeah, uh, liturgical accessories and things like that, not icons. So can you talk a little bit about like the distribution of functions and powers, like even within yeah. the Christian repertoire, it's not icons that are at the forefront always. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I, I strongly get that uh, that feeling that it is relics. I mean, this is also something that we find, you know, Grabar and uh, they 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 they've talked about this. And then with the work of Bissera Pencheva, where she I think uh, I think very convincingly shows that well, you just didn't have processions with you know uh, icons of the Mother of God, who was seen as I mean she she was this important figure you know for for the city, but they just don't come until after iconoclasm, till really late, like tenth century, um, and that makes me, but but you know it makes you think there were all these relic translations. Maybe those relics were not seen once they came in, but they came in. They were came in in processions. There you know these. Um, also images which show these things, you know, with, with in caskets and stuff like that. Um, and some really magnificent relic translations, like the translation of the Mandelian in 944. Um, 
And we just don't have that, that kind of evidence again for sacred images. We, when we have it, it's always an image which is like a relic. So I really mm. get the sense it's it's the archaeo poetos, or it's an an, an even um, it, again once again going back to the text. I like reading uh, texts. Um, you know what pilgrims pilgrims coming in really seem to talk about are relics, and when they talk about icons, very few very few times. It's always the icons which are bleeding or crying or which have relics, you know. Right. Um, Alexei Lidov, the uh, you know uh, the uh, art historian, he's done wonderful work on how even the doors of Hagia Sophia, I mean, those are relics, and images which were on them were relics. They were miracle working icons. So it seems to me this this uh, you know icons, what we call icons, you know, today the way the way we refer to them had to assert their importance initially by being like relics. So I think what, what really, you know, captured the imagination just literally, spatially, but also imaginatively were statues and relics. And that icons were, they came later, they were a much more conflicted category, as I think is attested to just by the fact of, of iconoclasm even having occurred. Right. Um, I mean, there was also lipsanoclasm, yeah, which we understand much less, much fewer studies done on it, you know, during, but, but relics were definitely there, they were important. And I think what, what assimilates statues and relics is they collected statues in the early centuries, they collected relics on the yes. same scale. Those two were happening at the same time. They were, I do not hear of them doing that with just a plain old image, <laughs> you know, of Christ. That's an interesting, yeah, I had thought about statues and relics, um, like there's the fabulous collection of relics in the Pharos uh, Museum, yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Sophia had a spectacular collection of relics. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like they had essentially museums of classical art yeah. in a number of places, but I've never heard of anybody collecting icons, no. or no, like, they like the famous yeah. icon. Exactly. They don't. And these, I mean, what is interesting is they, they come from outside. Statues right. and relics. And that's in a way also, I mean, I'm working on this for a, a paper uh, that I have to give in Oxford next year. I'm thinking about this, you know, just this thing of bringing from outside that gives them their power in a way that endows them with a sort of charisma. We just don't hear of a plain old image being collected on that scale, that sheer right. scale, that desire to get, you know, um, uh, let me clarify for the audience that because earlier you mentioned the word translation is, uh, because that's a technical term uh, yeah. so that refers to a formal process of relocating an object from one city say to another that usually involves processions and you know maybe a festival or something like that so it's a, it's a technical term for that um, from Latin um, yeah. um, I just realized now that some people might not know the, the terms yeah. Uh, yeah. so yeah and maybe in many ways, your book is cutting icons down to size in a way. Like they have this outsized importance in the way we think about. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't just want to use the term um, art, Byzantine art, but also the, the kind of material culture that was involved in um, anything that wasn't, you know, mundane. So spirituality, prophecy, you know, uh, you know, holy power and, and, and so forth. And you also mentioned a few cases where icons fell short of expectations um, yes. and even people at the time recognized that they had. Can, can you tell us an instance of this? Or so what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I mean, well, once again, the, the, the very that the fact that I, I think what really comes out through all this is how interestingly they were thinking and skeptically they were thinking about. Uh, just images in general, the categories, but also religious images. You know, there's this other uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, notion about Byzantium as sort of they are just mindlessly religious all the time. They're constantly sort of performing proskinesis and not doing anything else and that they mm. blindly believe. But it's very, very clear that this was not. This was a culture where there was debate where and they were thinking in very logical ways uh, and in very probing ways. Uh, about these things. And I mean, uh, really, the, the idea about literal specific failures of icons in at big, crucial moments, sieges and so on, it comes from your work on the failure of Theotokos icons, you know, in, in the, uh, the Spanish yeah. revista that you have uh, published, which I find 
really provocative. And I think it's very important for art historians to look at that because it, it's just doing away with some of our orthodoxies to make a bad pun. I mean, it's just doing away with this, with this really entrenched notion we have, of, oh yeah, the theater course was so powerful in battle and she went, you know, she was carried, her icon was carried and so on. So yes, it was carried, but they were very, very cognizant of the fact that it wasn't working, that there was a period when this just wasn't working. Uh, like the Battle of Mansikert, mm. but I think, uh, Atale Artis, I think, uh, talks about, or Anna Comnina, when she writes about, you know, uh, Alexis. Manzilion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, or wrapping the Maphorion and going out uh, in yeah. the battle. And then it's just such a sort of unmitigated disaster. You know, you just, you have to stuff it in a tree trunk and run away and things like that. This is stuff we need to pay a little attention to, I think, uh, against the usual. Uh, sort of triumphalist account of sacred images and this is not to say that I'm I'm, I'm being an iconoclast though I, I do right. kind of, I do kind of like Leo and you know Theophilus I really like I think he was a cool emperor with all you know with all the automata but um, it's just a way of bringing back some balance and to in a way show how interestingly people were thinking about these things so how is it that icons became, you know, the the not only the center, but like they account for the largest, you know, the the bulk of of scholarly attention um, in Byzantine art and religious, um, you know, material culture. Like, so what is it about icons that <laughs> have made them dominate today in a way that they didn't like for hundreds of years in Byzantium? Is not toward the yeah. end that they became dominant that way? Well they survive in greater numbers, even though those numbers are not as great as, you know, in absolute terms, they're mm. not that great, just relatively, they're there and the statues are not, they're just not there, you know, that much. <laughs> uh, so one is just what we have, the evidence yeah. of what we have. The other thing is, I mean, they they are, they, some of them are really beautiful and there's, there's a whole rich discourse around them too, which I think has been done beautifully by various uh, scholars, you know, um, uh, but again, it's I'm, I'm always trying to look at whether the bigger picture tells us something else. When we step, the minute you step out of that church, the minute you step out right. of your little chapel and come out, what happens? Um, uh, and and that's that's what fascinates me. Even the word devotion that we use a lot, uh, I think, in medieval studies in general. I mean, what, what is it? There are many different components to it. If we read just uh, some of the devotional devotional poems of, say, Christopher Mithilini, uh, there are really interesting things happening there. Or, or Geometris. I mean, he's he'll talk about Christ and he'll talk about Phaeton and his chariot, you know, in the same mm -hmm. life. And maybe those things were not as separate as we think them to be. Right. And I should say... <laughs> that you've actually worked on icons a lot. So you're, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and actually the first time I heard you give a talk, it was a very, very uh, insightful sort of analysis of icons and your first book was on them. And so you, this is, you're not coming from a position of, you know, of, you're, not, you're not mounting a campaign to sort of marginalize icons <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but what you said reminded me of the Parthenon in the following way. Mm -hmm. Today, most of the discussions about the meaning of the Parthenon focus on the frieze, right. which is never mentioned by any ancient author, including Pausanias, who describes the building. Right. There you go. Why do we talk about the frieze? Because we have the frieze. We have it. Exactly. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. And the frieze was literally tucked away, you know, between <laughs> the wall and the colonnade. Like it would have been very hard to see in antiquity. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I think right, right there, you've pointed out uh, certain things that we really need to keep in mind. The field oh, of art. That's history. interesting. So, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you've also written a chapter on epigrams and statues. So, mm -hmm. because often, like many monuments in Constantinople, they they were accompanied by a text to tell us, yes. or yeah. to speak as if in the voice of the monument. That yeah. those yeah. are the ones I love. Uh, yeah. So tell us about an epigram and a statue that you find a that you found particularly sort of evocative combination. Oh, that's that's a good one. Um, so this this one, uh, 
not necessarily on a statue, but I mean, this, this is an epigram I really love. It's about Eros and it's, it says something like, oh, look, the statue of Eros, this figure of Eros has been melted down and uh, sort of made into the uh, handle of a frying pan. So Eros felt fire and he's now serving fire, you know, serving the, uh, you know, uh, being served. I, I, I just love stuff like that because it's, uh, it's just so fascinating to me to think of, you know, uh, the handle of a frying pan. I mean, I, I have to use that stuff every day. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe it used to be, you know, the God of love. Uh, am I touching some interesting parts here? <laughs> you know? um, yes. I love epigrams like that. I mean, Ivan Derbich in, in art history has, of course, written on uh, ep epigrams, but he focuses on sacred epigrams, you know, Christian epigrams. But there's this whole other uh, really playful, wonderful epigrams that, that we find in, in the anthologies. So the one that you mentioned, that seems to draw attention to the materiality, like the, the, how fungible the material is sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And I've come across similar, so I didn't make the connection when I was reading the chapter, but um, in liturgical implements. So there are occasionally instances where I don't know. And these might be apocryphal stories, but they get at the anxiety of how the material itself can be used for different things, right? Like yeah. uh, a prostitute will donate some silver and it's made into a liturgical implement. And then That's everyone right. is like anxious, like, wait a minute. That's right. That Yes, yes, that's right. Some of the early saints' lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the material is, yeah. They're thinking just about... Uh, where did this silver or gold or bronze come from? Yes. That that would be interesting to think about in terms of frying pans. Yeah. I mean, this, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any final thoughts about statues. What should, like, do you have any advice for younger scholars, what, what they might be looking at, where this field might go or, or anything at all? Um, I guess, uh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's a big one. I guess, I mean, all I'd say is this was just my attempt to really try and give statues their due in a way uh, beyond their just being residues of the classical world yeah. and beyond their just being ornamental and, and giving grandeur. I mean, there's much more to them. And I guess my advice to younger scholars would be uh, read a variety of texts uh, and and look at a variety of different materials, you know, uh, because uh, there's so much. I feel I've barely scratched the surface of, of so much stuff, and I keep discovering new things. Yeah, you know? yeah, but you make an important contribution in this book, which is to so it's to strike against the way we periodize things, yeah. not based on when they existed and were used and perceived, and yeah, but when they were created. Yeah. Right. And that classical art is what was created in classical antiquity and Byzantine art is what was created in right? yeah. forgetting that all the prior stuff still survives. Yeah, exactly. Right. And just because it wasn't created then doesn't mean that it's not like important mm -hmm. for that culture. It could be yeah. hugely important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, in the same way that the, the Parthenon is arguably way more important today as a national monument than it right. ever was for ancient Athens. It was one among many. There, there, there you go. Yeah. 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 And you can't say, oh, we're not going to be talking about that because it's an ancient thing. <laughs> no. Absolutely. And also ideas of belonging. I mean, I remember one, one uh, of the reviewers, anonymous reviewers uh, in, for, if, for the manuscript had said something like, but, but these were all foreign, you know, why? They, they, they weren't even, can you even call them Byzantine, these statues? Right. And my thing is, well, you know, what is belonging and what's not? Like the, the Elgin marbles, I mean, the British are very aware that these are not our, but they very much feel it's, it is still ours. <laughs> it's, yeah. these are not things that, uh, just because they they don't actually belong doesn't ever prevent people from thinking they do belong, as we well know. <laughs> yes, we stole them fair and square. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, you I I, I want to close with a a phrase from Jerome, who had a uh -huh. wicked wit. Oh yeah. Oh yes. And uh, so this is a a church writer um, in Latin, like around four hundred. And he wrote a continuation of Eusebius's Chronicle. Anyway, it, it's in Latin. And 
when he reaches the reign of Constantine at some point, he has this phrase where he says that Constantine adorned his city with the nudity, the nuditas of all other cities. Yes. Right. And it's this pun on the yeah. nudity of the statues and yeah. how he stripped the other cities bare yeah. in order to make them yeah. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very apt quote. <laughs> that is absolutely. So uh, apt. Jerome. <laughs> Someone should write about the just the naked the discourse of nudity in the visual you know spaces of uh, of concept. Yes. Oh yes, yes. Well, you know, we don't have icons that wasn't it Cyril Mango who pointed out that we don't have any Orthodox icons that smile. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, that is like something that the Cyril Mango would have. Uh, yes. Sounds very like Cyril Mango, a scholar I admire hugely. Yes. And when they're nude, they're usually like emaciated and about to die. Anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Paroma, it's lovely to have you on again. Thank you, Anthony. It was yeah, so nice you. to talk to you. And I always get new ideas, uh, you know, whenever, whenever we talk. Yeah. Well, let's uh, we'll make it more more frequent if we can. Um, Absolutely. Once you get back to Michigan from from Do, uh, you know, there's actually a train between Chicago and Ann Arbor. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. I have I have ridden that train. I thought you were going to say between Chicago and Do. I'm sure there must be one. Oh, I don't know. Yes, yeah, pretty. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, I have, and I I I visit Chicago regularly, so I. I'm oh, sure. let me know when you come. Okay. Absolutely, I will, and likewise, you should come to Ann Arbor. <laughs> uh, Ann. Yes, in fact, I might. I, you know, I have a lot of people um, in in Ann Arbor um, who, are, who I know are close friends right now. Anyway, uh, good. Okay. It was a pleasure. This was great. Take care. Take care, Anthony. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye.